Good day, brothers and sisters. It is Sunday once again. Let's prepare our hearts for God's Word, and let's prepare ourselves to worship the living God. You know, one of the things that I know is happening right now is that there are a lot of people who are worried about so many things, and that includes believers in Christ. And one of the things we worry about are provisions with the rise of fuel prices, with war taking place, and so many things. At times, it cannot be avoided that we worry about our sustenance and our livelihood. However, as believers in Christ, one of the things that God has given us an assurance with is that He will never leave us. The exhortation in the Bible is very clear that if we seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness, all of these things shall be added unto us. Oftentimes, uh, there is a verse of Scripture that has been often quoted, and that verse basically says, He will never leave you nor forsake you. And it's quite interesting that we have applied it to almost anything and everything in our Christian lives. But unfortunately, we lose or we have not really seen the context of this passage. And I'd like to bring you to that verse of Scripture where we quote this, but at the same time the context, so that we might have a specific appreciation of the application of this verse. So it goes in using the ESV version in Hebrews 13. It says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. See, the context of he will never leave you nor forsake you is money. And so the point that is being driven by the author of the book of Hebrews is that we are not to be overly concerned about money, our provisions, how we could be sustained, uh, survival for the future. Why? Because for as long as we have this relationship with God and we are in this abiding relationship with Christ, we are not to worry about the things of this world. Why? Because God will take care of us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And it says here, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. So there's really nothing to fear. And I know that a lot of people, even while they're worshiping, they're thinking about where will I get my next meal or how do I get a job and so on and so forth. And so instead of worshiping the Lord, we're worshiping worry. And friends, that should not happen. Our Lord is sovereign. Our Lord is our provider. He will take care of us. So let's just focus on worshiping God and let Him take care of whatever needs we have. Let's worship the Lord. God of all creation, we come in celebration. We rejoice in Christ the King. Jesus is Lord, hallelujah, sing. Heaven and earth are filled with praise. Shout amazing grace Oh what great salvation brings Jesus is Lord, hallelujah, say
Prince of Peace, His love never ends. We exalt Your name. We exalt Your name. He's the great. We come in celebration We rejoice in Christ the King Jesus is Lord, hallelujah, sing Heaven and earth are filled with praise Of the redeemed shot amazing grace Oh, what great salvation brings Jesus is Lord, hallelujah, sing God of all creation will descend from heaven with a shout With a voice of an angel and with a trumpet of God The dead in Christ will rise first Then we who are alive and who remain will be caught up together With the saints in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air He's coming Coming back again We shall be with Jesus Christ our King He is coming Coming back again
ang pag-ibig mo Walang katulad inalay mo Buong buhay mo para sa kaligtasan Ikaw lang ang Diyos Ikaw lang ang Diyos Ang mahihim Purihin ka Sambahin ka Yesu Kristo Oh, oh, oh.
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. All over the news right now is the war of Israel against Hamas. Hamas, a terrorist organization, caught Israel by surprise two weeks ago, just as the Jews were wrapping up their Jewish festival called Sokot. Hamas attacked from the air, sea, and ground, resulting in the loss of 1,400, the kidnapping of more than 200, and the wounding of 4,000. October 7, 2023 will be remembered as the deadliest attack on the Jews since the Holocaust. People were bombed and shot at. Heads were cut off. Women were raped. Many were burned alive. Bloodthirsty Hamas slaughtered men, women, the elderly, and children. And they paraded the paraded some of the bodies in Gaza. You see, we live in a terribly evil and twisted world. How will we be able to live our lives in this world if we do not have Christ? Let's try to put ourselves in the shoes of those who lost their loved ones in this brutal attack. How would we face this tragedy if we don't have Christ, if Christ is not the center of our lives. If money is the center of your life, then what happens if it's taken away from you? If studies, career, or business is the center of your life, then what happens when you fail, when you lose your job, when the business goes bankrupt? If the family is the center of your life, then what happens if you lose them in a brutal way, just like what the, the Jews experienced on October 7? You see, we must revolve our lives not in the fleeting things of this evil and chaotic world, but in the eternal lordship of Christ. Everything can, can change in an instant, but Christ will never change. 
everything can be taken away from us in an instant. But Christ will never abandon us. Christ is the only sure foundation of our lives. Therefore, Christ alone deserves to be in the center of our lives. Christ alone, solus Christus, Christ alone. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you today to continue to live Christ-centered lives. There are a lot of uncertainties in this life. That's why it is so, it's so important for us to continue to live Christ-centered lives. So we're talking about being Christ-centered today, and why don't we turn to one of the most Christ-centered books in the Bible, the book of Colossians. So kindly turn to Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. Colossians 2, 6 to 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for today. We thank you, Lord, that despite the wars and rumors of wars, you are still sovereign and you are accomplishing your work in this world. And this world will continue in chaos and turmoil until all fall on their knees and bow down to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so we pray, Lord, that you would use the church, you would use believers to spread the gospel, that more and more people would know Christ. And I pray, Lord God, that more people would receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And we pray, Lord, for believers that we would not find our comfort in this world, but may we find our comfort in your word, in your presence, in your Son, in your Holy Spirit. And we pray that we would live Christ-centered lives, showing that Christ is sufficient, Christ is our all in all, that He would influence not just a part of our lives, but all the aspects of our lives. Oh, we live in such a terrible and dark time, but we know, Lord God, You have called us to shine more than ever right now for our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray even, Lord, as what is going on in Israel today, I pray that your people would see that they need Christ, that Christ is the Messiah. And I pray that this war would result in a lot of lives converted into Christianity. This is our prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the main idea of our text is the phrase that says, walk in Him, walk in Christ. Walk is a metaphor that refers to one's life and conduct. And so when someone is asking you, how is your walk, is not asking you how you literally walk. That's not the point there. Walk is a metaphor of how you live your life. So when someone is asking you, how is your walk? Is asking you, how is your life? And why don't we reflect right now with our lives? How are we doing? How are we living our lives? And in whom should we walk? What does the text say? We're called to walk in Christ. In other words, we are to walk in union with Christ. To walk in harmony with Christ. And to walk in Christ is to live your life in consistent submission and faithfulness to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. While your old life was all about you, this new life is all about Jesus. Jesus is now the center of everything. Jesus is the center of your identity. Jesus is the center of all the aspects of your life. You're not compartmentalizing your life that Jesus just belongs to Sunday or Friday Bible study. No, but Christ is your all in all. 
what it means to walk in Christ is to walk faithfully in union with Christ. So how is your walk? How are you walking in union with Christ? Are you living your life in consistent submission? Are you still submitting to Jesus Christ? Are you living your life in consistent faithfulness to the Lordship of Christ? Are you constantly allowing Him to rule and reign over your life? Or is your life still about self? It's not yet about Jesus. Is Christ really the center of all that you are in everything that you do? Is He the center of your identity? If not, then we need to put off anyone or anything that's reigning as the center of your life and you need to put on Christ. He deserves to be right at the center of your life. Living a Christ-centered life is not an option for us. It is not a suggestion. Walk in Christ is an imperative. It is a command. We must live our lives in undivided faithfulness and obedience to Christ. Moreover, as we analyze this word walk, it's actually in the present tense which means that you don't just begin walking in Christ, you must continue walking in Christ. I like how the Berean Standard Bible brings out the significance of this continual walk. As uh, the BSB says, continue to walk in Him. You have to continue. It's not just about starting your walk in Him. It is continuing in Christ. The NIV and NAT or NET also bring out the essence of the present imperative when they translate the phrase as continue to live your lives in Him. Continue to submit to His Lordship. Continue to obey and, and follow Him. Continue to center your lives in Him. The NLT also does a good job when it says you must continue to follow Him. Now, the Christian life is like a walkathon, as we see here. You know, it's a walk. It's a walkathon. It's a pilgrimage. It is a journey. It is a lifestyle. It is a daily, continual, step by step, moment by moment, yielding to the Lordship of Christ in all the aspects of your life as we've heard many times if Jesus is not Lord of all then he is not Lord at all he has to reign in all the areas of our lives now why would Paul command the Colossian church to continue to live their lives in Christ what was the problem that he was trying to address around 60 AD Paul was compelled to write a letter to the church in Colossae, even though at that time he was imprisoned. A false teaching had entered the church and he had to correct it. The heresy was not explicitly named by Paul, but as we read Colossians, we could have a clue on what this heresy or false teaching is all about. And it's a mixture of Greek philosophies, pagan practices, and Jewish legalism. All of that is mixed up and a lot of people have integrated these philosophies in their lives. In other words, the believers in Colossae were no longer faithful to Christ. They were no longer loyal to Christ. They were walking in pagan and Jewish philosophies and practices. For them, Christ was not enough. They could say, yes, Christ is enough, but they are not living as if Christ, Christ is enough for them. They wanted to integrate these philosophies and traditions that are man-made into their lives. And that's why Paul is saying here in Colossians 2, 6, to continue to live your lives in Christ, in Christ and nothing else. In essence, Paul is saying, don't just begin in Christ. And then all of a sudden, leave him. For what? Pagan and Jewish philosophies and practices? No, you must not only begin in Christ, you must continue. 
You must continue your walk in Him. You must continue living Christ-centered lives. Let Christ and Christ alone rule your hearts. Renew your thoughts. Change your affections. Sanctify your motivations. Govern your will. Direct your path and influence all the aspects of your life. No one else deserves to reign in your hearts except Christ. Let nothing else stand as the center of your life except Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, before we unpack the characteristics of a Christ-centered life, we must make sure that we already have Christ. We must never assume it's always helpful to check our hearts you need to understand that you cannot walk in Christ if you don't have Christ in the first place. Receiving Christ is the crucial starting point of a Christ-centered life. So going back to verse 6, it says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Receive Christ. That is so important. Now the verse starts with a therefore. After Paul prayed and gave his thanksgiving, after he declared the supremacy of Christ, after sharing his ministry to the church, Paul is now transitioning from the doctrinal aspects to the practical matters of the Christian life. And verse 6 serves as the hinge between the first major section of the letter to the second. The first emphasizes on right theology. You have to have a right understanding of who Jesus is, who God is. And the second major section focuses on right application. We shouldn't be people who are simply good at talking, but we're not good in our walking. Our talk must be consistent with our walk. If you have head knowledge and that's all that you have, you don't have a heart in in tune with Christ, then that will simply result in pride in hypocrisy, in self-righteousness. And there are many Christians who boast that they have a Christ-centered theology. But how are they living their lives? Some of them are just Christians on a Sunday, but pagans from Monday to Saturday. Is that really a Christ-centered life? It's not enough simply to say we know Christ. We must show to our family, to our friends, to our church mates, to our classmates, to our office mates, and even to strangers, that Christ indeed is the center of our lives, that He is the Lord of our lives, and that we are His disciples. Paul now goes on to say, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord. Paul then goes on to say, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, this word receive is important. It's usually used by Paul to refer to the receiving of a tradition or teaching about Christ and His significance. Have you received Christ Jesus, the Lord? Who is Jesus to you? Do you know Christ? Do you know what His name means? Do you know the meaning of the titles of Jesus? Jesus has a very beautiful name and his titles are powerful. First of all, in the verse, it says Christ. What does Christ mean? A lot of people think that it's the last name of Jesus. No, that's not the last name of Jesus. Christ simply is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah. And so Christ and Messiah, they're the same. They're the same thing. There's no difference in meaning when you say Jesus Christ or Jesus Messiah. When you declare that Jesus is the Christ, you are declaring that He is the Messiah. When you call Him Jesus Christ, you're saying Jesus, Messiah. To say that Jesus is the Messiah is to believe that He is the Anointed One of God, the Chosen One, the Son of David, who will deliver His people and reign as King of Kings. Now, Jesus, what does the name Jesus mean? The Hebrew equivalent is actually Joshua. 
And so Jesus and Joshua are really just the same name. Jesus is from the Greek language and Joshua is from the Hebrew language. And Joshua, what does the name Joshua mean? It means Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. That's the meaning of the name Jesus. Yahweh saves. Yahweh is salvation. What a beautiful name. His name gives clarity to his mission. Jesus came, why? To seek and to save the lost. To receive Jesus is to receive salvation because his name means Yahweh saves. Yahweh is salvation. What a powerful name. Now that we understand the meaning and significance of the title Christ and the name Jesus, how about the Lord. What does the Lord mean? Now in the text, you find the article the before the title Lord and shows us the Lord is being emphasized here in verse 6. And the Lord is from the Greek kurios and it means master, someone who has absolute ownership and rights over his slaves. Some people do not know the significance of calling Jesus Lord. When you call Jesus Lord, it means you have surrendered your life to Him. You have surrendered your rights. You have surrendered your independence. You have surrendered your possessions. You have surrendered everything to follow Him. If Jesus is the Lord, of your life, then you are no longer the master of your life. Jesus is the master. Jesus is the Lord. If you don't like calling him Lord and you don't like to be his slave, then what is the alternative? If you're not a slave of Christ, then you remain to be a slave of sin. Jesus said in John 8, 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. That's very clear. If you practice sin, you're a slave to sin. Now, do you want to continue as a slave of sin? Do you really want sin to be your master? Sin does not desire for your good. It desires your death and destruction. Would you rather have sin as your master? Would you rather have Christ as your master? Would you rather be a slave of an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving Christ? Would you submit to Him as Lord? Now, I like how the ESV and the literal translations translate or render verse 6. It says, Christ Jesus, the Lord. Some translate this as receive Christ Jesus as Lord instead of Christ Jesus the Lord. And maybe you're saying right now, it seems like this is not really that important. Sounds the same, not much of a difference. Receive Christ as Lord or Christ the Lord. But let me suggest to you that as Lord somewhat diminishes the impact and the force of the Lord the Lord. You see, what Paul is emphasizing here is not that the Colossian believers have received Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. It's not the emphasis here. The emphasis is the absolute, universal Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, why is that important? What's the significance of that today for us? The significance is this. Jesus is Lord no matter what. Jesus is Lord whether you receive Him or not. He's not the one who loses if you don't receive Him. We are the ones who lose. We are the ones who become defeated if we do not receive Him. Jesus does not need us to be Lord. He does not need us to remain or continue to be Lord. Jesus is Lord no matter what. Whether you receive Him or not, Jesus is Lord and Lord of all, and nothing will be able to change that. His Lordship is not dependent upon us. His Lordship is absolute. 
His lordship is universal and none can stop him from reigning forever and ever. And that's why we are to surrender to his lordship, abandon the losing theme of the kingdom of darkness and enter into the kingdom of light. And in the kingdom of light, the victory has been decisively accomplished. Jesus has decisively won against sin, Satan, and death. Why should we receive Jesus? His name is the only name that has the power to save, Acts 4, 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Why should we receive Jesus? Because He is the Christ. Matthew 16, 15 to 16 says, Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Why should we receive Jesus? Because Jesus is Lord. Romans 10, 9 to 13 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Will be saved. Don't look for another savior. Jesus alone saves. Don't look for another Christ. Jesus alone meets the qualifications of the Messiah. All the messianic prophecies are ultimately fulfilled in Christ. Don't look for another Lord. One day every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And you would be a fool not to receive Christ Jesus the Lord today. Receiving Christ Jesus the Lord is the crucial starting point of a Christ-centered life. You cannot walk with Christ if you don't have Him in your life. And if you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, like the Colossian believers have done, then you must remain faithful to Him. The essence of a Christ-centered life is simply remaining faithful to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, remaining loyal to Christ's Lordship in all the aspects of your life. Remain faithful to Christ. Let's read Once again, Colossians 2, 6 to 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Verse 7 gives us four characteristics of a Christ-centered life. Let's start with rooted in Christ. Now, rooted is in the perfect tense in the Greek. And why do I bring that out? The perfect tense is about the continuance of a completed action. It means this. Something happened in the past. There is a completed action in the past. But it's not just a thing of the past. The moment you receive Christ, you were also rooted in Christ. But you're not just rooted in Christ in the past. Praise be to God that you continue to be rooted in Christ in the present. The previous rooting is implied in this verse, but it is the present rootage that is stressed in this verse. Isn't this something comforting that all those whom the Father has rooted in Christ will never be uprooted? Those who have received Christ continue to be rooted in Christ. And the picture given here is from agriculture. And the visual image that we get is that of a tree. A tree that is firmly rooted on the ground, getting its nutrients and stability as it is deeply rooted on the ground. 
Now, Psalm chapter 1 gives us a similar image. The psalmist talks about a man who delights in the law of the Lord, who meditates upon the law or the word of God. And the result is that this man is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Psalm chapter 1 talks about a man who is firmly rooted in the word inscripturated. Well, in Colossians chapter 2 verse 7, Paul is talking about a Christian who is firmly rooted in the word incarnate. And who is that? Jesus Christ. Are you rooted in Christ? Another similar image is in Jeremiah 17, 7 to verse 8. And the man in Jeremiah in uh, Jeremiah 17 is a man who trusts in Yahweh. And because he trusts in Yahweh, he's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Jeremiah 17 talks about a man who is firmly rooted because his trust is in Yahweh. When Colossians chapter 2, verse 7, it's talking about a Christian who is firmly rooted because his trust is in Christ Jesus the Lord. For us believers, Christ is the source of our spiritual lives. The nourishment for our souls is found in Him. Growth and maturity cannot be obtained without Christ. And the deeper we root ourselves in Christ, the greater the stability and security of our spiritual lives. The deeper we root ourselves in Christ, the greater the maturity and growth and progress that we will experience. So are you continually abiding in Christ? Are you continually listening to His words? Are you following His example? Are you spending quality time with Him in prayer and meditation of His word? Are you constantly engaged in worshiping Christ Jesus the Lord? Let's remind ourselves of John 15, verse 5. I am the vine. Jesus is speaking here. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You and I cannot bear lasting fruit if we are not abiding in Christ. If we are not abiding in Christ through prayer, through praise, pondering upon His Word, and putting His Lordship at the center of our existence. The next characteristic of a Christ-centered life is being built up in Christ. While well, being rooted is from agriculture, being built up is from the world of construction. Root that gives us a picture of a tree. Built up gives us a picture of a building. And let us be deeply rooted in Christ so that we will be built up in our spiritual growth and maturity. Built up is in the present tense. And the significance of this is that it is an ongoing process. Being built up in Christ is an ongoing process. And the NASB brings out the significance by stating, having been firmly rooted and now, and now being built up in Him. The process of being built up is ongoing. It is like a building that is still under construction. And guess what? That's you and me. We're like buildings that are still under construction. And if we're still a building under construction, that means we have not yet arrived. Those who think that they know it all, they're too spiritual to be corrected or rebuked, that's the kind of attitude that will stagnate a spirituality. And they often, these people would often regress in their spirituality because they have ceased 
to grow. We must always seek to be better. We must always seek to be teachable. We must always seek to be humble. We must always seek to be open, open to rebuke and correction. We must never stop growing and we must not hinder the work of the Holy Spirit. God is using other people so that we would see our flaws and we would reflect Christ all the more in our lives. We're like a building under construction, which also means that we must be patient. We must be patient with our brothers and sisters in Christ. There's no such thing as a perfect church. Our church is not perfect. Living Word is, is not perfect. We're all sinners. We're all still under construction. The important thing is that we seek to be faithful to God. We seek to be available. We seek to be teachable and humble. People are busy about growing their careers and businesses. They're busy about a lot of things in this world. But are, are people busy? Are people busy in growing in the Lord? What's sad is that people would rather be busy in the fleeting things of this world. And they're not getting busy in the eternal things of the kingdom of God. Are you still growing in conviction? Are you growing in your knowledge and understanding of the Lord? Are you growing in Christ-like character? Are you reflecting Christ in your words, in your attitude? Are you growing in your competence, in your skills? You're getting better in interpreting the word of God in evangelism, in discipleship. Are you continually growing? Now, Paul does not state what kind of edifice is being built up here, but it is probable that he has the temple, the temple in mind. In Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, it says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him, you also are being built up together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. God is building all believers into His holy temple. And He used the apostle and the prophets to lay the foundation. And Christ Himself is our cornerstone he's the chief cornerstone the most important stone in the structures of ancient architectures our foundation is christ therefore it is solid it is sure and all of us believers are being joined together in christ as we grow and what is implied here is that we cannot grow alone we're not designed to live out Christianity just by our own selves. Growth is in the context of community. You and I need each other. You and I need the church. How many of us are actively engaged in small groups? How many of us are in small groups or as we call them now as growth groups? Are you in a growth group? I invite you to join any of our growth groups. The leaders of this church do not have any other motive. All we desire is that more and more people would know Christ. More and more people would glorify God in their lives. More and more would grow up in Christ-likeness. And so let us resolve to be busy in growing from one level of maturity to another, step by step, layer by layer, together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Christ-centered life is a life that is rooted in Christ, being built up in Christ. And it is a life that is being established in the faith. Established in the faith functions as a summary of the first two characteristics. It builds from the previous two and emphasizes the significance of the Colossian believers' stability in the gospel. And this is the gospel that they have received. The Colossian believers were being established in the Christian faith. 
It is important to note that once again, being established is in the present tense, signifying the ongoing process of grounding yourself in a Christ-centered worldview, rooted in Christ, built up in Christ, established in the faith. That is what it means to be Christ-centered. Now, the next line in this verse is, just as you were taught. What does this line or phrase refer to? Could it be just referring to the faith that was taught to the Colossians? Actually, if you look at the structure of the text, it points to the inclusion of all three characteristics, not just one. In other words, the Colossian believers were rooted in Christ just as they were taught. They were being built up in Christ just as they were taught. They were established in the faith just as they were taught. Correct teaching is vital in our Christian walk. A true Christian desires Christian and Christ-centered instructions from believers. And true Christian teaching instructs believers in their rootedness in Christ, their ongoing growth and progress in Christ, and their continual deepening in the faith. Are you constantly exposing yourself to Christ-centered teachings and preachings and classes? conferences, books, and other resources, whether they are print or digital? Are you continually strengthening your convictions in the faith? Or are you easily tossed to and fro by strange teachings and doctrines? It is vital for our spiritual growth and maturity to have a regular dose of solid Christ-centered teaching and preaching. And maybe some of you are saying, do I really need to be that serious in my faith? I'll just let the full-time workers deal with that. It's their job. I'll just pray. I'll, I'll just give. I'll let the pastors, the full-time workers do all the work. Besides, you know, I'm just an ordinary, ordinary Christian. Now, did you know that it was not an apostle? who shared the gospel to the Colossians? Did you know that it wasn't an apostle or a prophet who planted the church in Colossae? Did you know that God used an ordinary Christian, just an ordinary Christian, to plant the church in Colossae? Who is this ordinary Christian? Colossians 1, 3 to 8 says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras. Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. It wasn't Paul. It wasn't Peter. It wasn't John. It was Epaphras. Epaphras heard the gospel in the ministry of Paul in Ephesus. And he received the gospel and so overjoyed with the gospel that he brought home the gospel. He went to his hometown, Colossae, and he started sharing the gospel, discipling people, and eventually planting a church in Colossae. Now, how is this encouraging to all of us? You do not have to be an extraordinary Christian for you to be used by God. You don't need to be a full-time minister. All you need is to be a full-time Christian. And what I mean by that is you're full-time in your devotion, in your commitment, in your loyalty to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Many of our churches in Living Word were planted because of 
ordinary Christians hearing the gospel, receiving the gospel, and then bringing the gospel to their homes, bringing the gospel to their hometowns, bringing the gospel to their communities and even other nations. If it were only up to the full-time pastors and evangelists and missionaries, then we will never be able to plant multiple local churches. We're all been given this duty, this privilege to make disciples of all nations. And we need to play our part. We need to play our role. And we need to ask the Lord to use us if we're available and teachable. If we are faithful, God will indeed use our lives. Now, the next characteristic of a Christ-centered life is abounding in thanksgiving. From agriculture to construction, we're now back to nature. As the picture here is like a river overflowing its banks. Douglas Moo says, Thanksgiving plays a prominent role in Colossians. Paul apparently being convinced that the true gratitude for God's grace is an important offensive measure against the false teaching. Abounding in thanksgiving is also in the present tense, meaning that the overflowing with gratefulness to God is not just a one-time thing, not just a thing of the past. It must be ongoing. It must be an ongoing spiritual discipline. As David Powell says, that the fourth characteristic of a Christ-centered life points to a need to be involved in a continuous act of worship through which one reaffirms the Lordship of Christ. Are you still engaged in worshiping God, in thanking Him, in reaffirming the Lordship of Christ? Do you have a thankful heart? Are you prone more to grumbling or are you more prone to be thankful? You see, an ungrateful heart is a dangerous sign. It is an indication that a person is drifting spiritually. Some who is, someone who is ungrateful is someone who is straying from the Lordship of Christ. People who have left the faith are people who have lost their thankful attitude towards the grace of God. They have become self-entitled. They're no longer grateful. They feel as if they are entitled to the grace and blessings of God. They have been more focused on their problems and their sins. They're no longer looking to God with a thankful heart. When your heart is void of thankfulness, then it means that your heart is filled with something else? Is it filled with grumbling? Is it filled with anger? Probably even anger towards God. We need to check our hearts. When your heart is void of thankfulness, then you know Christ is no longer the center of your heart. A Christ-centered Christ heart is a thankful heart. A self-centered heart is a heart that is self-entitled. A heart that is proud, a heart that is arrogant, that is a thankless heart. If we are ungrateful to God, then we need to change our hearts. We need to ask the Lord, Lord, please change my heart. We need to put off self and put on Christ. Do not let a day go by without counting your blessings. We have been blessed by the Lord every day whether it be physical or material, but more importantly, spiritual blessings. There is always something to be grateful for. Even in the darkest of days, there is always something to be grateful for. If you can't think of anything else, then look to Christ. Meditate on His person and work. The Lamb of God bled and died and rose again. And He did that to save you from your sins. That truth alone is worth 10,000 thanks and praise to God. 
That truth alone, the, the truth of Christ's death and resurrection is worth an eternal shout of praise and thanks to God. We've learned what it means to have a Christ-centered life. And it starts by receiving Christ. And as we have received Christ, we need to remain faithful in Him. I'm blessed to be a father of four. My wife is uh, currently pregnant, eight months pregnant. And um, I'm excited when uh, my son would be born to this world. And some of you who know me are asking yourselves, uh, what do you mean for? I know about Zaza. I know about Z. And then your wife is pregnant now. Who, who's the third? Why do you say four? Actually, last year, we experienced one of the most painful experiences that we had gone through as a couple. My wife experienced a, a miscarriage. Her first visit to the clinic of Christine's OB, the OB said there's no heartbeat, and she said it might be too early, so come back again. On the second visit to, to the clinic, there's still no heartbeat. And the doctor said the chance of survival of the child is very slim. And so we were crying, we were praying, we were pleading for the mercy of God. Third visit, there's an improvement. It was really just a roller coaster ride. Somehow there is hope that this child could survive. But on the, uh, the fourth and, and final visit to Christine's OB, the doctor concluded that the, chi that the child, the hope for the child's survival had run out. It's been too long for the baby to have or not yet have a heartbeat. And Christine, yes, had miscarriage last year. Even though I have not yet seen my child, I have not yet held my child, that is still my child. And it's only then that I've realized that having a miscarriage in the family is no joke. It is painful. And with everything that happened during the pandemic and typhoon or death, and then we experienced the miscarriage, I thought to myself, I think I would just go crazy if I did not have Christ. You see, Christ makes all the difference in our lives. Christ makes all the difference in the world. And where would we be right now if we don't have Christ in our lives? If Christ is not the center of our lives, how will we survive if everything else is crumbling before your eyes? Christ saved us. Christ continually is sustaining us. And Christ will be with us even to the end of the age. He will be with us always, even to the end. Have you received Christ? Are you remaining faithful to Him? Continue to live a Christ-centered life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I don't know what your people are going through right now. I don't know, Lord God, their trials and tribulations, their suffering, their pain. But you are our all-knowing God. You know what we are going through. And we thank you, Lord, that you are not only a God who knows all things, but you're a God who cares. And so I pray, Lord God, that you would minister to those who are listening right now, that they would remain faithful to Christ, that they would remember that they are rooted in Christ and are continually rooted in Christ, that they are being built up in Christ, 
And you're using even the good and the bad to build us up in Christ. Remind us, Lord God, that we have been established in the faith. And the faith is rock solid and sure. It is a faith that comes from you. A faith that is grounded in your word. And through that, O oh Lord God, may we look to Christ, his person and work, that we would be like a river overflowing with thanks and praise for how our Christ saved us, how, we, how he is continually sustaining us, and how he will never leave us nor forsake us. And so help us, Lord God, not be distracted in the things of the world and not invest our lives in this world, but invest it ultimately into your eternal kingdom. May we not live for the fleeting. May we live for eternity. May we live for you. May we live for your kingdom. And I pray those for those who have not yet received Christ, would you work in their hearts, Lord God, that there would be conviction of sin through the Holy Spirit, that they would see how sinful they are and how holy you are and how they need Jesus. And may they confess Christ Jesus, Lord, today. May today be the day of their salvation. And I pray, Lord, that you would use more and more ordinary Christians to declare Christ, to share Christ, to evangelize, to make disciples of all nations. We thank you, Lord. Help us to continue living a Christ-centered life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. It's been a wonderful Sunday, so please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and our Facebook page and spread the word around. We want other people to hear God's message. God bless you all. We'll see you next weekend. Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Good news, brothers and sisters. Our radio program will now be heard nationwide through FEBC radio stations. As an added bonus, all Living Word original songs will likewise be aired as well. So, if you would like to listen to our radio program, we're coming out in the following stations. 702 DZAS AM Broadcasting from Pasig every Sunday, 11 a.m. to 11.30 in the morning. We're also coming out from 104.3 DWAY FM from Legaspi. This is also every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 in the morning. And for those of you in Tacloban, we're coming out from 97.5 DYFE FM every Monday from 11.30 in the morning to 12 p.m. For those of you in Zamboanga, we are coming out from our station in 1116 DXAS AM every Sunday from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Also, for those of you in Davao, we're coming out from 1197 DXFE AM every Sunday from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 p.m. For those of you in Coronadal, we're also coming out from Station 1062, 
DXKI AM every Saturday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you in Cagayan de Oro, we're coming out from 103.3 DXJL FM every Sunday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you from Metro Cebu, we're coming out from 98.7 DYFR FM every Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. Please tell your friends about this and tune in to our radio program. Let us pray that God might use this radio program to become a blessing to as many people as possible. God bless you all. Great news, everyone. We already have three weekend services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-0000068-00. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234814. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount, enter the name LWCCCII, and account number 0010006068. Zero, zero, and send the receipt to office at livingword.ph Then click Send Money You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.